Hello students and welcome to class three video lectures individuals and families. Uh, today we're going to cover two chapters five and six. Um, we're going to be looking at building blocks of communication and verbal following, exploring, and focusing skills. So as always uh, please come to class prepared, uh, complete your readings, uh, be ready with questions, uh, and be ready to participate in the in-class activities as well. So without any further ado, we are off to the races. Building blocks of communication, communicating with empathy and authenticity. Um, very important skill sets and concepts that you will need to learn uh, as this will become an integral part of your practice as a social worker. So uh, let's walk through uh, the readings and talk about um, this particular aspect of the work. We're going to take a look at um, explaining and going into more detail. And so the goals of Chapter 5 are to really look at developing an empathetic response, um, being able to uh, act assertively, appropriate self-disclosure, uh, explaining social worker and client roles, uh, explaining clients' rights and limits to confidentiality, uh, and decrease your ability to uh, convey accurate empathy. Very key, important part of the work that we do as social workers. So in the initial interview, um, your first meeting with your client, your client families. Um, when we think about roles, uh, roles of the participants, we want to often keep in mind that clients will come into situations and settings um, with expectations about what your agency does, what you're able to do, um, fixing my family, uh, making my husband act properly, making my children obey and have a number of expectations for you that may or may not be very realistic. And so it's our job as social workers to really make sure that clients understand the scope of the work that we're actually able to do with them. And so we do that pretty much at the onset um, so that uh, we don't set up this dynamic of uh, clients having one set of expectations for us and those expectations not being very realistic. Um, so you always want to, do, you know, explain that particular role, what it is you're there for, um, asking questions around uh, what do you hope or what do you wish for in terms of your work with us here at this agency. Um, when you thought about coming here, what were your ideas about what kind of help you wanted? So things of that particular nature uh, are ways to kind of get a, a sense of understanding what the client's role is in that. Um, as well as looking at the reason for the referral and things of that particular nature as well. So again, making sure that you understand all those dynamics. Um, also, sometimes it's important to just acknowledge and empathize uh, with the sense of urgencies that clients will bring to you. Um, being able to express uh, your intent as a social worker in your role um, and explaining to the client realistically what can and what can't be accomplished in the time frame that you have or with the, the conditions that have been presented to you. Also, uh, making sure that clients, again, understand the whole notion of informed consent because often in the assessment process you are gathering lots of information um, and you're explaining confidentiality, but you also want to help them understand what the agency policies are about who has access to that information um, and what your plans are to do with it and, and what conditions you can release it. So, those are all very important factors to keep in mind. And then as we think about uh, facilitative conditions, we're really looking at building on, on empathy and really for us honing on, on some of those skills around how to, to be more empathetic in terms of our work with our clients. So again, when we think about empathetic communication, it's really the social worker tuning in to the client's needs, issues, feelings, um, and there are a number of different things that you'll need to be able to do in this process of learning to become empathetic. Um, it's, it's your attempt to walk in your client's shoes as they are sharing their story with you. And so things like um, 
nonverbal communications will also be um, important for you to pay attention to as well. Facial expression, cues, tone of voice, uh, speech, whether people are nervous or tapping on things or uh, looking away or, or distracted in other ways. These are things that you need to be able to tune into as a social worker in your interview with your client to really try to understand what those behaviors are and what they're about. And we also know that there is a difference between a sympathetic and an empathetic response. A sympathetic response is just that. It's about being sorry or expressing some remorse for things that may have happened to one, but that's very different than an empathetic response. An empathetic response is your attempt to really have the client get the sense that you have a clue about what's happening for them. And we'll talk further in further slides about how to do that. Um, also, the need to develop percept perceptiveness around feeling. So what people are feeling or what they may be feeling and really starting to ask questions and use phrases that really help you explore and get at what's happening underneath uh, the things that we're actually seeing. Accurately conveying the empathy. And so in your books and your reading, you will have seen these five different levels of an empathetic response. Um, and they might range from uh, anything. Uh, a low level response basically is one that doesn't reflect a lot of empathy in terms of what a client situation might be. So a low level piece may be that I've uh, just got released from a treatment facility. I have to do some aftercare uh, and I really want to do something that's uh, close by my area, close by to work because I need to do those things and that's important. A level one response might be, well, you really need to be concerned about uh, staying sober uh, and making sure that you are following your treatment plan and you know not be so concerned about you know where the actual facility is uh, actually there. That's showing the client that I'm really wanting to move forward in terms of getting a, a, a piece of work accomplished without really understanding what's driving this client's need uh, to have things work that way. So a higher level empathetic response uh, might be, wow, it sounds like uh, work is really important to you and being in your neighborhood are important things that you want to do. Uh, and so I think those are valid and we need to really look at what we can try to find in your area uh, to really just kind of help accommodate that because we all know that part of treatment uh, is making sure that things are accessible and reliable and uh, easy to get to and that's just a part of that. So that's a higher level of an empathetic response in terms of I'm understanding what's important to the client, I'm acknowledging that I get what's important to him, and I'm actually looking at trying to tailor the response to meet that, those particular needs. So again, um, looking at those empathetic communication skills are going to be an important part of your learning. Uh, responding or with reciprocal empathy, so a lot of times um, you will be in situations where you need to get a sense of what's happening for your clients. So this particular phrasing in terms of uh, how you might frame a question to get an empathetic response or get a reciprocal empathetic response, which really helps them dig deeper in terms of what they might be experiencing at that particular point in time. And then also recognizing that the empathetic communication has any number or multiple uses. So it, it allows you to do all of these things in terms of your work with your client. So it gives you some insights into these particular areas. So that's another reason why the, the empathetic communication is very important. Um, also being able to get your clients to start to respond empathetically as well. So to really get them at a level where they're talking about the affect and the feelings and, and the emotions that they might be experiencing about the circumstances that they're there. It gives you much more insight in terms of the depth and the level of uh, trauma that clients may have experienced. And so without that, you don't have a clear sense about what the treatment might need to look like or how intense it might be based on the impact it's having for the client. So really using words that are effective, um, really um, intervening in, in, in sessions where clients are not validating messages, uh, really wanting to make sure that they understand the importance of being in touch with those feelings as well as giving feedback are all a part of that empathetic response. Also authenticity, you know, being clear about who it is you are as a social worker. 
uh, and as a person and as a human, and a caring, compassionate human being. And being able to convey that is what authenticity is all about. So uh, self-involving statement, personal self-disclosing. So there may be circumstances that are similar that might be appropriate for you to share with a client uh, regarding experiences that you may have had because what it does is it that self-disclosure piece also uh, works to increase empathy because if you have had situations that may have been similar or you can convey that you've had circumstances uh, that can connect to what your client's experiencing then they're that much more uh, apt to actually share at a deeper level with you because they feel like they have a better sense or understanding of what some of the issues that they might be experiencing. So again, um, that authenticity is very important in terms of the self-disclosure and really timing and knowing when to self-disclose and when not to, and what to self-disclose and what not to as well. Again, the I pieces around authenticity, um, describing the targeted behavior that you're looking at uh, and saying needs to happen, um, and identifying the impact of the problem and solutions or the behaviors of others. So the authenticity piece is, is really just that, uh, reflecting accurately back what you're experiencing, what you're seeing. Also looking at cues for authentic responding. Um, looking at all of these things that are listed here uh, in terms of um, the authentic responding initiated by social workers, for example. You know, uh, disclosing past experiencing. Uh, sharing ideas and reactions, uh, experiencing discomfort in those particular sessions, you know, um, and letting people know that there's some understanding around what happens in those kind of circumstances uh, are also ways of res responding authentically as well. Uh, the positive feedback, um, also when you think about um, focusing attention on specific behavior, so really picking out Oftentimes clients come to us um, and they've got a myriad of issues that are happening and they're unable to see the positives that are happening in their life. So sometimes it's about our authenticness in terms of being able to help identify some of those, some of those things uh, that clients are doing that they, don't, they take for granted. Or the fact sometimes that they just showed up in your office to ask for help in and of itself is, is, a, is a very positive thing. Um, and something that you would want to share with the client as well. Um, and then relating assertively to clients, uh, making requests and giving directions, um, leaning into those clients' angers. If you'll remember, um, and we, we have spent some time talking about assertive communication as a way of really looking at being able to express the need and the request for behavior change. So that's a part of uh, what you learn back in generalist practice. Or for those of you uh, who will be taking this this fall, this is what you will learn in generalist practice. So uh, again, being able to do that um, assertively is an important skill to actually have as well. Um, and then being firm about your requests. Uh, and these are some examples of what that might look like. So now we're moving on to the next chapter, uh, which is chapter six, uh, this notion of verbal following, exploring, and focusing skills. Um, and the things that we want to highlight in terms of the learning from this particular chapter are um, as follows. We're basically wanting to look at how to paraphrase, uh, learning the difference between open-ended and closed-end questions how to seek concreteness. In other words, really taking what clients are saying to you and drilling it down to something that we understand in a much more concrete form. Um, providing and maintaining focus, learning how to summarize uh, the things that you heard, uh, looking at how to construct these reflective responses um, in terms of the information that you gather from clients. So that's what we'll spend some time talking about in this particular chapter. So when we think about um, 
maintaining psychological contact, uh, which is a great big old set of uh, fancy words. But we're really looking at stimulus response congruence. So um, if I provide some information to a client that might be troubling or, or that might be um, really hard to hear uh, under normal circumstances, and I get a response back from a client that is fairly minimal. Uh, that's something that I need to be aware of. Uh, so again, it's around that stimulus response congruence to really make sure that clients are tracking uh, and that you're getting accurate information uh, from them as well. Um, and then the content relevance, uh, again, you know, the extent to which the social work responses are perceived by the clients as relative to their substantive concerns. So really honing in kind of tracking in to what's important, what the client is saying, um, and what's relevant in terms of the conversation that you guys are all having. So when we're thinking about the verbal skills, so as you're thinking about your interviews and you're thinking about your assignments that are coming up um, that are connected to the interview, then the verbal skills are going to be important pieces for you to spend some time and, and recognize. So uh, reading back to your chapters, but really understanding the nature of furthering, paraphrasing, reflection, open-ended, closing questions, seeking concreteness, uh, maintaining that focus and summarizing. So really looking at probing into conversations by asking those open-ended questions, by furthering responses. Um, you know, one of my favorite furthering responses is, so say more about that. So when I don't understand what a client is saying to me, then the more they can talk about what it is that they're experiencing or trying to get me to understand, then the better chances I have of understanding what that is. And then as I think I understand it, I paraphrase it. So I hear you saying that X, Y, and Z are the things. Is that an accurate response? And that reflection might be from that client, well, no, this is what I was actually trying to say. Or yes, that's, like, that's it exactly. So really looking at those skills in terms of the, the following are going to be very important for you. So again, the furthering, um, and we can do it in nonverbal and verbal ways. Oftentimes you'll see, um, for example, um, if you've ever been in an interview setting um, and you're interviewing for an internship or a job and uh, you're answering the questions and what you're getting from the people who are asking the question oftentimes might be a nodding uh, or nodding and a smile and, and a pleasant face expression. And so what that's doing is that's saying to you that uh, you're doing a good job in terms of answering that question, um, and the more you continue to talk and you're on that particular track, the more positive that response is going to be. So you as a social worker think about um, when you're able to get those kind of responses from your clients, it's the same way. Um, so thinking about furthering it are important concepts. Paraphrasing, you're restating the client's message in your own words, or here's what I thought I heard, or is this an accurate reflection? Um, so an example might be here um, where this particular example with the elderly client gives you an example of, of focusing on the cognitive aspect of what might be happening. Reflection, just simply identifying the emotions expressed by the clients. If folks are crying in front of you, uh, that's an obvious sadness that might be going on. Or there may be some frustration that might be behind that. Uh, so it's about reflecting what it is you're seeing and asking those questions about what it is you're seeing. Um, when you've got this complex reflection, you're really looking at um, Sometimes clients will give you information that gives you multiple ways or a really complex picture in terms of all the things that might be happening for them. Um, and then reframing for you is putting it in, in a different context. So is, you know, is there a way to look at this situation that appears to be hopeless uh, in a really different light? Is there something else that we could spin from that particular conversation that might be helpful? Open in and closing questions. Closed in questions are your short answer to the point. Open in questions are expansive and allows you to kind of probe even deeper. So understanding that. Seeking that concreteness, checking out the perceptions, um, looking at what the specific feelings are here and now, 
um, eliciting the details about a client's experience. All of those are things that help you get to a certain degree of concreteness in terms of the work that you're trying to do with your client. Focusing, um, making sure that we've got sufficient topics that are going to be, we're going to spend some time exploring. So if people are talking about things that uh, have been problematic from them for their childhood, it's really about trying to really understand what some of those things may have been about. So the open-ended responses, seeking concreteness, uh, and reframing and reflecting are all parts of this whole focusing piece as well. So there are times where you need to blend those responses in a way that helps you get to that place. And then summarizing. Um, here's what I've heard. Um, here are some of the key things that I'm, I'm looking at that I think that we need to work on or that you're presenting to me as being important to work on and really summarizing those things. Again, it gives you it, it, it allows the client to understand that you are perceiving, listening, and paying attention to what it is they're saying, but at the same time, it also gives them the ability to, to reframe or to redirect things if there are points that were missed or things that were misinterpreted by you in terms of your assessment. Uh, this is just a tool that really looks at uh, paying attention to those responses and those empathetic types of responses that we'll probably get a chance to use. So, this concludes basically our review and summary of the two chapters that we needed to read for this week. So, uh, once again, uh, please come to Class Repair and we will spend some time in class with some exercises that really help us explore much more deeper uh, these building blocks of communication as well as this verbal following, exploring, and focusing skills. So thank you for your time, and I will see you in class.